background. <laughs> Yes. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Denise Shervington, it's indeed a pleasure to be back with you um, addressing this ongoing issue of mental health challenges during the pandemic. I'm very honored to be joined on the panel with um, Lashonda Williams, the Executive Director of NAMI Louisiana, and Leon Winters, the CEO and lead therapist of Winters Mental Health and Consulting. And I'm just going to ask you both to introduce yourselves as you want to share with the rest of the folks who have joined us. So why don't I start with you, Ms. Williams? My name is Leon Winters. Um, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, board approved clinical supervisor, um, and I've been working in private practice for the last six years. I've previously worked in the education system, outpatient mental health, uh, child protective services, pretty much any venue that uh, provides services to children. So that's me in a nutshell. Okay, that's a big shell, so that's great. Um, how about you, Ms. Williams? You wanna introduce yourself to- Yes, good afternoon, everyone. My name is LaShonda Williams. I'm the executive director at NAMI Louisiana, which is National Alliance on Mental Illness. I've been the executive director for almost a year now. Previously, I was with NAMI Louisiana as the housing director. So uh, mental health is definitely a passion for me and I look forward to helping individuals however invested that I can, so. Okay. So let me start off. I am um, Dr. Shervington. I didn't say much more about myself. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm with the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies in New Orleans, I'm really leading all the mental health initiatives. I am also the chair of psychiatry at Charles Drew University, where we're training physicians to be psychiatrists. Um, so here we are, we've all experienced the collective trauma, the collective trauma of the pandemic. All of us have been kind of shaken to our cores. And I think together we are all trying to figure out how to continue to move through. It appears that we might be coming towards the pandemic being a little bit more manageable. And so, you know, I would like to engage us in conversation, certainly have our um, panelists answer, not answer, but discuss a couple teasers that I'll be throwing out there. And then we'll leave it open for, I hope a really lively conversation for the second half of our being here. Um, you know, I just want to start by saying that most of us, as we were going on with our lives, um, March up to about March 11th, 19th of 2020, you know, we weren't thinking about a lot of these existential issues. We certainly every day weren't getting up thinking that you know, thinking about issues of our freedoms, where we go, where we don't go. We weren't thinking about how ultimately we are individuals alone experiencing our conscious being in ourselves as much as we are connected um, intimately with other people, but we alone are having this experience of our life. We certainly weren't thinking about death that, you know, death is what all of us are going to experience. That's for certain. We just don't know when. We, we weren't. We weren't going around thinking about these things every day. And I think as we came face to face with this pandemic, whether or not we wanted to or whether or not we made it extremely conscious, these were some of the things we had to think about. What does freedom mean for me? What does it mean to face my mortality? What does it mean to think about myself as a separate human being from everyone else around me, no matter how much I love or care about them? 
I think these were some of the questions we were forced to confront. The trauma of a pandemic, knowing that at any moment, any breath, we could, that could be our entering the last parts of our life. And that as we have seen happen around us. So I hope that we can as honestly and as authentically as we can really use this time to think about what lessons we've learned. There have been about three phases to the pandemic that started where we were separated from everything we knew and thought was normal. Then the kind of middle when we were in the threshold of it, sometimes okay, sometimes not okay. And I'm hoping that with things being a bit more manageable, the virus seems to be something we are learning to cohabitate with, that we're more deeply reflecting on what were the lessons we learned about life and living. So um, I'm gonna ask, and the issue of mental health has become huge. Everybody is talking about mental health now. Mm -hmm. I am hopeful that we won't over pathologize what is a normal reaction to a threat mm -hmm. and that we can find ways that we can support each other without necessarily having to develop mental health conditions. So I'm gonna start and ask um, Ms. Williams, what does um, the, a state of mental health and well-being mean to you and what you think in other people with whom you work? Okay. What does it mean when we talk about this issue of mental health? Okay, and so, and, and just, Honestly, just talking about mental health, you think about just your overall well-being. And I know that we're talking about a little bit about the pandemic. And I know just I'll talk about myself for a moment. I know when the pandemic first started, it was it was stressful. There was a lot of fear. You didn't know what to expect. You didn't know what to do. So I'm a parent. I'm a, I'm a mother. I'm an employee. Um, so all of these factors just had so much to do with your mental health that you didn't know which way to go. I was juggling working as well as taking care of my kids at home. So being a teacher, being the cook. And at that point, it just it, it was very stressful. And you didn't know really how to handle it until things started to calm down. Um, for me, it just was kind of figuring out that balance, not knowing, you know, when to, at some point I'm trying to do a Zoom meeting with coworkers or employees and then have my daughters saying, hey, mama, I need your help. So that was, mm -hmm. that was that very difficult. And I must just say that through this time, I'm just very happy to see more people talking about mental health. It's bringing that awareness. More people are joining forces. And um, just to make sure I'm answering your question, but it just makes, it means taking care of, of yourself, you know, just making sure that you're okay. And sometimes I think through all of this, you forget to take care of you. You're trying to take care of everybody else, but you forget to take time for you. And then at some point you feel overwhelmed, you feel stressed. So I know just, again, I had to remember to exercise self-care even in my own home to make sure that I was taking the time for my kids, but also taking time for myself as well as my household. So, um, and in at NAMI, Louisiana, we've definitely gotten increased phone calls, just mm -hmm. people wanting to know where they can go, who they can contact um, to get more help for our loved ones. And so at NAMI, we offer signature programs that helps people to understand and know how to deal with mental health. We have, um, we have a program for peers and we also have one for the family. So again, just it helps people to know how to deal with certain circumstances and also understand that mental health is real and it's okay. And I tell people all the time, it's okay to not be okay and admit that you're not okay. That way you can get the proper help and treatment you need and making sure that you're, you're taking care of yourself, making sure that you're getting the resources and the tools that you need to be able to deal with the everyday life as well. And I don't want to, I don't know how long I have to talk. So if you need to stop me, stop me at any time. <laughs> well, let me ask um, our other um, 
partner in this on this panel, Mr. Winters, if you want to respond to what I asked, so you might want to say something else totally different. Well, it's really your definitely, I definitely want to respond to that because. You, when we talk about what is mental health, what, that, what does that mean for us and during the pandemic? And really it's a preservation of a healthy emotional state. And during the pandemic, whenever we worked with uh, our, our clients, we were talking about what are the things that you need? You know, Ms. Williams talked about self-care, mm -hmm. but in this moment of uncertainty, what are the things that you need to preserve that healthy emotional state? Because our balance, have, our balance is off. You know, the things that, the routines that we had normally are now done. You know, whatever we didn't, you know, maybe a week ago prior to the start of the pandemic is going to abruptly change. Mm -hmm. And knowing that we're creatures of habit, sometimes that creates things in front of us where we have to start thinking on the fly, you know, and depending on if you were already susceptible to uh, a mental illness or if you were struggling, you know, making ends meet before or just anything that was kind of that fine line, it created, you know, more, more stress. Uh, you know, Ms. Williams talked about becoming a teacher, you know, having to teach your child, you know, staying at home all day. And we, we know that getting outside, getting sun and those things are great for us. But what happened during that is we had to look for things. We had to redo how we preserve our emotional state. You know, sometimes going to work was a great thing to get away from the house, you know, be away from the kids. And now you're, you're there 24 hours a day. You know, there's a lack of socialization that was actually happening during the pandemic, because if you lived alone, you know, we, we saw that a lot of people that were living alone experienced a lot of stress. So basically, when I think about mental health, I think about actions and tools to preserve that emotional state that keeps us, you know, on the right path. Thank you. And, you know, sometimes as we are all know, mental health and well-being, and even I would think when the rappers started talking about getting in their feelings, mm -hmm. um, I think we're finally recognizing that our mental health is a part of our being. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to give a definition of what the mind is. It's simply the subjective reflection of what's happening in our brain and our brain's mm -hmm. sole purpose is our survival. Our brain is addressing what our internal needs are, the basic needs we have, matching that with what's on the outside through our senses. We sense our environment. And the mind is the conscious awareness of what is happening in our brain functioning. So I want to take the mystery out of it. We Neuroscience shows us that we have seven emotional states. This is a part of who we are. We're not separate from. Yep. And so I think one of the great lessons we could take away from the pandemic is knowing that we function mind body together. What we've called, we've just separated the concept of our mind. Because if you think about it, it's the only organ we know. We don't know our kidneys. We don't know our lungs. We might have some sense of our skin as an organ. So I'm hoping that we, this will help take the stigma and normalize for us the importance, as many of the both of you have said, of really caring for and attending to the mind. It's a part of who we are. It's the only way we know ourselves. And it's what gives us this conscious awareness of ourselves as being. And so with that, you know, I, do we want to talk about, Ms. Williams, you talked about self-care. And again, that has become a term. It's been co-modified, trivialized. People have made businesses out of it. But ultimately, I think that self-care is about knowing ourselves intimately so that we know what the things are we need to do to keep our minds well and our physical bodies well. So I wonder if each one of you can perhaps just share a little bit about some of the things you think are important to knowing self and caring for self, some of the things you might be doing yourselves or things you recommend to others. Well, I think that you, you definitely hit the nail on the head. A lot of times we hear self-care and people are like, 
passing out these planners to write. They're saying, oh, take a vacation. And those things are great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, the ability to know oneself is the first step in self-care because that's where we can create our boundaries. We know our likes, our dislikes, what we can tolerate, what we cannot tolerate. And so oftentimes when I work with clients, I have them go through like who or what in your life is a source that you fully understand that you can provide boundaries for or against. You know, because sometimes people are practicing self-care and some of that self-care is that we actually need to stop dealing with some people in our life. We need to stop dealing with some things in our life that we need to preserve, that we need to get away from. And so before you do the mani-pedi, before you go on the shopping spree, before you do all of those things, that sense of self, that understanding and sense of self first is what protects us. It's what helps us align ourselves emotionally, what gets us back to that healthy emotional state. So I, I love that we talk about self-care, but I think that oftentimes we miss the first component because if we don't have an understanding of self, then we tend to make decisions that actually don't reflect our needs. Mm -hmm. And when we yeah, do something that don't reflect our needs, what happens next is we get on that hamster wheel of just trying to find something, find something, find something, but we have not understood self first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. And if I get a chance, I really want to go through what the neuroscience shows us are the ways that our body expresses the need. Our number one need is to survive life mm -hmm. until we can no longer do so. And for some people to continue the speeches to reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to ask Miss Williams, and then if we get a chance to, I'll get back to, you know, talking a little bit about these emotional needs so that we become very familiar. So when Drake is singing about getting in his feelings, we know exactly what he's talking about. Miss Williams. Yes, and I do agree with Mr. Winters about knowing who you are. And again, just, I think that as he says, setting those boundaries, you have to know when to say no, you have to know what you can do, but you also have to be comfortable with yourself at, at in the very beginning. So, you know, and I, I say this and, and I'm going to refer to social media and, you know, I know it's, it's, it's everywhere now and I, I know it's not going anywhere, but I think sometimes even with social media, it makes people think that they need to be a certain way. And I don't believe that. I think we're all unique. I think we're all special. So you have to have that self-care. You have to love yourself first and know who you are in order to be able to, as he says, set those boundaries, know when to say no, when, no, you know, even I think, um, I think back when, you know, I was even younger and I felt like, oh, I have to please everyone. And so sometimes a lot of people do that. They say, oh, what does mom think? What does dad think? What does grandma? And, you know, they start thinking about what does all these other people think? And you start to lose yourself and not say what's best for me. So again, I, I do agree with what he said and do believe we have to set those boundaries to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves, knowing what we like, knowing what we don't like, so we can know when to say yes, when to say no, or when to say, okay, my body is sad, that's enough. I need to take a break and, and we have to listen to our bodies. So um, our bodies are, as you said, with the mind, that's the most precious things to us. So we definitely have to know when your body is saying, okay, this is enough. Let's take some time for yourself. Let me do what I like to do. Let me not focus on my kids right now. You know, I've, I've dealt, I've done with, I've dealt with them. I've dealt with my husband, my wife, whoever, and now it's my time. So to me, it's, it's definitely, again, also getting to know who you are and making sure that you are taking the time out for yourself. Thank you. Um, thanks for bringing up the issue of young people, of children. We know they have been having a difficult time during the pandemic. And I see uh, a lot of folks here who, and I think, at least I know a couple of you have some kids yourself. So I'd like for us to focus a little bit on young people. Oftentimes their voices don't get elevated. We saw that, I saw that happen after Katrina, no one was paying attention to the kids until they started to burn the village down. They weren't getting any warmth. So it's like, we go have you um, 
pay attention to us. All the data, I just looked at some new data coming out from the American Psychiatric Association. Anxiety disorders are up in young people. Mm -hmm. Depression is up. Suicidality or suicide gestures, that's up. Mm -hmm. um, we know that as kids are entering into school, back into the educational system, they're not performing as well. There's much more anger, angry behaviors happening in the classrooms. And of course, and then there are teachers. And we have done some um, surveys at Iowa showing that similarly, the anxiety and mm -hmm. depression and post-traumatic stress disorder is very high in teachers, much higher than it used to be. Another point I just got reported on last week was there's increasingly more grief in children. More are becoming orphaned around the world because they've lost their caregivers. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to, you know, have to take care of ourselves, but then the children depend on us. Without adults in their lives, there's no one to shape and help them become the human beings that they can become. So can we spend a few minutes talking about young people, what you're seeing, what kind of things you think we need to put in place to support their mental health? Mr. Wilson, what do you think? Winters, I'm sorry. I'm actually um, a child therapist and um, I've seen so many different things as far as the PTSD is, is very significant, uh, mm -hmm. especially in those who I've worked with children who've lost parents, grandparents to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the biggest things that I'm actually seeing aside from PTSD is uh, some developmental delays or maybe even some social, um, some socialization issues. Uh, for children who might, especially in that zero, I work with children as young as three, um, and in that three to five, I've seen a lot of uh, milestones missed when working with children that young. And so, like you say, the, the task talk about, are we on the right track? I think the schools are going to have to implement something that probably universally targets socialization from that zero um, all the way up to about 12, 13. Um, for probably over the next five to six years to increase that socialization aspect that was lost over two years due to COVID. Um, I've seen countless things as far as, you know, PTSD, the anxiety. Um, we're, we're reaching points where children in middle school are really struggling to get out of cars. They don't want to detach from their parents. So even some attachment issues that have come, you know, due to COVID or even some family loss that is created. Uh, some significant patterns of grief in children. And I think that something universally uh, is going to have to be done. You do have teachers getting back in the classrooms who are, they themselves have experienced loss. They've experienced tragedy um, due to COVID and they are coming back to school guarded. They're coming back to school, uh, you know, edgy, experiencing PTSD, anxiety, or depression. And uh, I just did a presentation where I talked about you know, someone needs to do an inventory. Like if you have a school, if you work in a school system or you are a principal, someone needs to be taking an inventory of the teachers that we have on our campus to, you know, to assess their need because they are going to be leading our young scholars going forward. Mr. Winters, we have done that in New Orleans. Um, my organization, we surveyed two school, um, I guess they're different CMOs and what we find I can share with you is pretty alarming. 36% um, of teachers, we had a sample of around 500 teachers, 36% reported depression. Symptoms of, we, we didn't go in and do, this is just screening. So these are symptoms of depression. Uh, we didn't do a clinical follow-up yeah. after that, but they still screened positive. 36% for anxiety disorders and 19% for post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD meaning that there are um, the, there is something that makes someone feel that they had an encounter with death 
-hmm. So whether it's from being very sick or they saw someone really, really very sick or close to death or saw death. And then a month or so afterwards, they're having problems. They can't put the stuff out of their mind. They keep reliving it, might have nightmares. They um, try to avoid any memories associated with what happened. They don't want to go to any places. I remember after Katrina, some people with PTSD didn't want to be anywhere near the Superdome if they had been there. They also begin to find that they're kind of hyper on the hyper alert, very stimulated, um, feeling agitated. Um, and then they're just feeling badly about themselves. With PTSD comes a lot of depression, a lot of negative thinking. And so the extent to which we have seen increases in our caregivers, not only our parents, caregivers, we haven't surveyed parents, but certainly we, we know we're having our own struggles as parents, as Ms. Um, Williams even said individually, the stress of having to be a worker and a parent at the same time. Um, so we're gonna have to support our teachers as I said, we're going to have to figure out, are there some policy changes we need? Are there things, how do we encourage those workers who are having clinical symptoms to get help? And then again, of course, with our children, as I said earlier, some of the data we've gotten um, in New Orleans is that there is increase, continued increase in some of these trauma conditions. So it behooves us to think about, depending how we enter this, are the, what are we gonna advocate for in terms of mental health and what kind of policies we think need to be put in place. Things have changed. We're not going back to the way things used to be. That's over. There's a new train, the train is out the station. This is cohabitated with the pandemic, we don't know for how long, clearly it's become manageable enough so that some of those public health precautions yeah. are um, not there, but there are still outbreaks. And so the old ways we used to go about our usual way of life, that's changing. And how are we gonna find new ways of being and new meaning in life? Um, I don't know if you, if anyone, maybe we should open up for some conversation, I've, unless there's some more things that you want to share, Ms. Williams or Mr. Winters, before I invite members of our panel to share their experiences in terms of mental health and well-being during these past two years, or continuing through these past two difficult years. One of the things I think that I think is really important is, you know, definitely addressing some of the mental health issues that happened in the Black community. Um, you know, when we talk about COVID-19, when we talk about access to resources, access to treatment and things like that, um, I've seen a significant increase there. Uh, I've actually had clients who experienced not being able to get treatment, you know, um, who've experienced that, that hospital stressor, you know, and I think that that's something that we, we also would have to look at. Um, we already know that um, when something happens in America, some, there, there's some disproportionality that happens in Black America. And I think that that's also a topic um, that really needs to be addressed as far as, um, you know, treatment and just, you know, PTSD that has been experienced. Mm -hmm. And I would like to just um, share that I know at NAMI Louisiana, we have a pilot program called Share and Hope, and it's designed for the Black community. And it's basically to, I've actually facilitated two sessions so far where we just invite people from the community to come out and let's just talk, you know, like what I, I, I label um, my session as let's talk. And it's basically just getting people talking about mental health especially as he said in the black community, the black and brown community, just getting them to talk about it, letting them know that it's okay. You know, we all, we have all suffered some kind of way with some type of mental health issue, whether we've lost someone, um, lost, you know, lost something or something traumatic in our lives. So 
Um, I know that there's times that I know I've gone through a depression or anxiety or just something, no matter what um, it was. So it's okay. And I, I also let them know that it's okay to not be okay, but it's, but we have to talk about it so we can start putting them in and getting the resources that we need and, and helping them and also collaborating. I know um, I'm going to mention I'm in Louisiana. We actually have, we're coalitions. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. I just yeah. got to, okay. Um, we're part of a coalition and we're part of several coalitions and task force. So one thing that we have to remember to do as well is just collaborating because there's so many things out there that we are unaware of. And I feel like if you collaborate with someone else and talk to someone else, you'll start to learn of those other resources and other options that's out there. So we have to continue to stigmatize and make in mental health more comfortable for everyone to know that it's okay to bring in, um, raising awareness, educating people, just all of those, you know, so we have to make sure that we're doing it, doing that. And um, I'll speak on the children's part um, just for a bit, because again, I feel like as a mother, as a wife, I have, I've dealt with so many issues, even from the kids' stance. And I know I had my middle child who, you know, when she was out of school and school finally opened up, she was so anxious. Like she told me she woke up that morning. She said, mom, I couldn't, I didn't sleep. I'm so excited, you know, but I think being away that socialization as Mr. Winters mentioned, um, and is it Mr. or Dr. Winters? I'm sorry. I don't want to. It's say Mr. Winters. Name. Not doctor okay. yet. I'm in, in my program. <laughs> <laughs> so as Mr. Winters stated that socialism, being away from people for so long, and I I know my kids were only out during that first part for, from March until May. When August started, they actually went back to school because it's a smaller school. I know school children that didn't go back for almost a year. So those children suffered more than even my kids. I know what I had to deal with even with my own children. And I, you know, you saw their grades when they were finally able to get back into to the school system, grades were dropping because at home, you probably have sister and brother helping you answer questions. So now they're getting back in school. They don't know, they don't know, um, they don't know how to kind of work on their own anymore. Or they're almost afraid to talk to the teachers and say when they don't need help, only because at home, they almost had to teach them in some in some um, situations, there were some where the teachers were maybe on a Zoom, but there was a lot of that Google Classroom where you kind of worked on, at your own pace and sometimes had to out on your own. So it's it's so much. And, you know, as, as we mentioned, children need us and they don't know how to express certain things at certain times, especially younger ones. But I know, again, I know even for myself, I talk to my children a lot. I have a 13 year old, so I make sure that I talk to her. I ask questions because I also think it's very important that we recognize certain signs early enough so that we can do something. And it's, it's not as detrimental as it would have been if I let it go on for months or years with it being not talked about or you know not getting the right treatment um that's the, that's the part on the kids and then now I'll talk about just working at NAMI Louisiana the calls we get you know we get calls from everywhere from schools wanting to see how they can get more resources or if there's some type of presentations or webinar webinars that we may have that they can show to students, to staff. I mean, just as we mentioned, the pandemic just affected everyone. So it, it's not, we can't just say, oh, it's the young or it's the, the older, it's, it's everybody that was affected. And I think, you know, that's where we're having to brainstorm and just figure out how we all work together to make sure that all communities, everyone is, is actually, being helped and getting the treatment that they need. Um, and I'm gonna say that, okay. oh, oh, look, I'll stop. <laughs> I'm gonna let you go no, ahead please. and answer some questions. Okay. So um, I just saw something in the chat from, mm -hmm. um, is it from Eamon Williams? Would, would you mind coming off camera and asking you a question or you wanna have us read it? Hi, um, yeah, my name is Iman and I had a question. I've seen a lot of media coverage, um, especially during the pandemic about microaggression uh, and dealing with uh, toxic work environments uh, and the impact on 
especially uh, Black women's mental health. And so I was wondering if anyone on the panel had any recommendations for dealing with workplace and other stressors during the pandemic. I can jump in a little bit, you know, as we talk about microaggressions, usually things that people say or do that they didn't think the impact that doing these things would have on the other person. And usually we're talking about it in, oftentimes in terms of race and gender. Um, is that what you meant, Miss Williams? I just wanted to be clear. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, oftentimes the, what you will, what people will say is when you are receiving those kind of microaggressive, usually it's language, that perhaps it is the thing to say back to the person or persons is that the thing that you said or you did, this is how it impacted me. Because supposedly, you know, we're going anywhere from the subconscious to the unconscious. In microaggressions, there's not a very conscious awareness that the statements or the behaviors were going to cause harm. Um, I could tell you just one that just happened recently um, in my workspace, but we will let that go. So I think it's being able to respond in a way that it doesn't put, you're trying not to put that person in a defensive position because then they're just going to, you're not going to get anywhere with that, but just letting them know again, perhaps more I statements. When you say that, this is how it landed on me and this is how it made me feel. I find, and um, Mr. Winters, and you know, I'm a therapist, you're one, that oftentimes it's when people can honestly share what they're feeling that oftentimes help those feelings to go away. But we do know that the pandemic created work just got shifted around for so many people. We, for people who, if they were working remote, then who knows what we do when we're on the Zoom and we miss each other and we might say or do inappropriate things. Or if we're back in if we're essential workers and we're back in the workspace, the anxiety and fears that we bring and the depression. So there's a kind of heightened emotionality. And mm -hmm. some of the work I've done with organizations is you might have to create a little more space in the workplace for people to feel freer to just as best they can, it's not, you're not creating, you're not doing therapy, but a more supportive environment so someone can come to work and say, you know, I'm not feeling on top of the world today, or I'm feeling great, I'm here to support. I found that I was surprised going at the beginning of the pandemic when institutions or organizations would ask me to come talk that some places they don't even have staff meetings. They weren't having regular staff meetings. Someone told me she had no idea that someone on her team had lost seven people. This was at the beginning of the pandemics. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're gonna have to rethink work from mm -hmm. how frequently people need to physically turn up to what kind of climates will we can we afford a little more vulnerability in the workspace? Mr. Winters, I think you want to say yeah. something. I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I am a big proponent of work culture. And when you talk about like microaggressions and stressors and things like that, you know, um, I'm fortunate to have six other therapists on staff with us, along with front office staff. And I think encouraging, you know, transparency you know, with the understanding of how you feel, because it's hard to be transparent about something when you don't know how you feel about it. So if we're transparent and we're, we're, we have understanding of self and we're transparent, then we can talk about those things in the workplace. And any environment, like uh, Dr. Servington said, that any environment, they're, they're going to need to have some flexibility. They're going to have to, they're going to have to have some openness regarding anything that's happening. I mean, you never know what's going on. Um, but great environments are really on top or in front of any microaggressions that are coming there. Now, great environments. That doesn't mean that some environments might not miss the mark and there's not a time for us to really say, hey, listen, 
your behaviors and thoughts are not landing where you thought they should. And so being transparent and being open and understanding like, I feel impacted by that statement gives an opportunity to remind people um, that that's not going to work. And so, you know, if you talk to anyone on our team, they'll tell you transparency is our key. Transparency is our key. Growth is our goal. Helping is what we do. And when we can stand by those, we can automatically, you know, check those microaggressions. We can check anything in the environment that's not conducive or productive to the work that we do with the clientele that we serve. Um, Ms. Williams, anything you want to add before we move on? Basically, just piggybacking off of what was already said, that I do believe that if some if something is happening, you do have to just acknowledge it and be able to address it and try, as as mentioned, you know, keep it non confrontational as possible. But also, just that flexibility and and making sure that people are are comfortable and able to, you know, I think. Again, the pandemic has caused so many changes and brought about so many changes that some people, if you went from working strictly at home remotely to going back into the workplace, that's a lot of people that was just stressful by itself. So I think we do have to allow that flexibility and making sure that the that the workplace is a safe place that you can come to someone and, and definitely get those issues addressed and not just keep it bottled up because of course we know if it when it does come out, it's gonna be it's gonna be work. It's gonna be bad. So being able to address it right then and there, I, I definitely believe is the key in keeping that transparency and being open. And you know, I want to share with the amazing folks who chose to spend this hour with us. You know, we're as we're talking so much about mental health. And excuse me if I'm saying things that you already know, um, but I feel we really need to teach ourselves about what it mean, means to be mentally healthy, because as was said, in the black and brown communities, there's not enough therapists to go around. It's not going to happen. So how do we understand ourselves, each other, and can support each other? So I just wanted to share a little bit about, again, I say science, but it's common sense if we really have the time to think about it. But, you know, what are some of these emotional needs? And I bring that up because I hear so many people, young people saying, I'm in my feelings, I'm surprised, I feel emotional. We should know what the emotions are there for. And they're there to signal to us the extent to which our basic needs for survival mm -hmm. are being achieved. So I'm going to share the seven needs that we have emotionally. And again, I hope I'm not insult insulting anyone's intelligence. If anything, if you already know, it's just a refresher. The first basic need we have is to seek out and to be curious. This is the way we understand our environment and how to survive. So there's this innate curiosity. So imagine what happens during a pandemic when we have that urge to seek and explore, we had to begin to think about it. I don't know for you all, but I remember in the beginning, I was scared to see people, to have people deliver food to my house, all the things that are so unnatural. So know that if you were having those feelings, it's because we have this innate drive to seek and be curious and to learn. We also have a need for sexual excitement in our lives. And I don't know how the pandemic impacted people's sex life, but no, however, it just, you know, from, from just say a sense of close intimacy to, I use the word they use, but this might be outdated, lustful, raw feelings, that this is also a need we have. So again, being comfortable with how did the pandemic impact me and my sense of my sexuality. It's important. We also have the need to be afraid. That's how we've protected ourselves. There is the lion coming and the body needs to have the signals to it to say, you need to decide, are you gonna run? You're gonna go in flight? You can fight, 
or you need to freeze. So don't be afraid of your fear and anxiety. Try to understand it. Where is it coming from? We also at times have a need for rage. And this is when and this is in particularly attached to that fight or flight response. Sometimes in order to survive, we need to really fight. The thing we know about our rage is we don't want to live there too much. We need to quickly understand what's that threat, why are we feeling we can be harmed, and do something about it. We also are wired for sadness and grief. It started very early on. If we did not connect with, we realized very early on that we can survive only with someone else. As human beings, we can't, at the beginning, care for ourselves. So we get connected, we get separation, distress, and it's okay. And again, the pandemic, the separation that we went through from those that we loved, and the grief we experienced if any one of them left, that's okay, that's part of who we are. We also have a need to nurture, to care for. Hopefully we got a, enough of it when we were young, but as adults, we can also find, and I think that's some of that self-care and sometimes that pampering, but not just getting the nails done and here it is. We need to go a little bit more about pampering and nurturing ourselves. Some people in the Buddhist world, it's said that mindfulness is activating the mother in us. Because when we're being mindful and we're paying attention, this is how I'm feeling right now and this is what's happening in my environment. That's like the good enough mother who is attuned to her child and knows her needs. And the last one I'll be quiet, the fun one is we're wired to play. Mm -hmm. We have the hormones in our body in particular, oxytocin that makes us want to be social, we need joy. Again, something that depending on how the pandemic hit us, the opportunities for play and that social joy became diminished. So I just wanted to share that. So as we are knowing ourselves better, as we're mm -hmm. thinking about mental health, we know what, how we are wired, the extent to which we're getting our needs met, some say is the extent to which we experience our mental well-being. Yeah, want to jump in, Christina Duong, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? I know we have a question in the chat. Um, sure. Hi, how are you? Good, how you doing? I'm good. Um, my name is Christina. I work for a nonprofit organization and um, majority of our clients are coastal um, entrepreneur. Basically, they are commercial fishermen. Mm -hmm. So since the pandemic, um, you know, a lot of things has been restricted us um, from doing what we need to do. So he is the main source of income in the family. Um, he wants to do everything by himself. Um, the family members recognize that he is stressed and they try to offer him um, help, you know, whether to help him work on a boat or, um, you know, they notice that he is changing uh, the way that he's talking mentally, you know, and physically he looks weak as well, but he does not want their help at all, at all. So how do you go about helping somebody who recognize that he is not who he used to be, but doesn't want anybody to help him? <laughs> it's very hard. That, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a great question. I think one of the first things we would look at is, has he explained why? Um, you know, we probably have some assumptions as to why he might not want the help, but has he said why? It's all about ego. He's like, oh, I'm a man. I can do this by, do this by myself. I don't need anybody to help. Yeah. And that was my assumption. So, you know, there are a lot of things that's tied to addressing those emotions, you know, and oftentimes when I work with men, uh, they tend to block out or not share their emotions because experiencing those emotions is something they probably never practice or they are there 
and they just walk right over them. And walking over them has been the safe way and even sometimes the conditioned way that men often deal with things. Um, I'm not a real big proponent of like hitting an emotional rock bottom, but I do know like the mental health laws in Louisiana, um, you know, are, are really difficult to get someone help um, unless they're threatening to hurt themselves. Um, LaShonda just put in numbers that you can give to them that would give, you know, an opportunity for him to talk to someone. Um, in my experience, I've often told the family members to, you know, give that, give that person my direct number and, you know, we'll start there, you know, because sometimes, especially when working with men, um, they just probably need to talk to someone who can relate to them and, you know, at least get over that hump if they're just kind of running through life, you know, you know, running through life and now walking and crawling through life, even though it's taking a physical, a mental and emotional toll on them. And I would not probably add, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just also going to add that, you know, sometimes I'm pretty sure this has been done, but just sitting down sometimes and talking to him directly and let him know what it's actually doing to everyone. Sometimes they, as um, Ms. Winston says, they don't kind of see what's happening. So just first step is just making sure that you're trying to at least have some type of conversation with him directly. I've also given um, information to non Louisiana. We have um, our different affiliates that have support groups for peers, which I'm pretty sure he would not be willing to attend right off, but also for family members where you can connect with other family members that's probably gone through what you're going through and they can say, oh, this is how we did it. So they can, you know, these support groups offer a lot of help and advice for people that's already gone through what you're actually going through. We I just try want to, to oh, I'm sorry. Um, well, um, it's not just us, but his family member trying to talk to him. But every time we talk to him, you know, he divert the subject. We can't even bypass. How, how do we ease that? I was going to share with you a story I heard that stayed with me. It was, and he's a pretty well-known writer. And he was talking about his periods of depression, extreme depression. And he said that, you know, people would turn up and they want to help him and they try to tell him things and everybody had their way that they thought he should come out of his depression. And he said the person who helped him the most was someone who came and just sat with him. There was no agenda. That person just sat with them. And that, that has really, really stayed with me. Um, that sometimes people just want to feel that there's someone who cares enough to take the time to be with them without their own agenda. Of course, we know the limits if, as Mr. Winter said, if there's real deterioration, there are ways in which you can do something to get him help. But maybe if there's someone that he trusts who has no agenda, but just to be there with him, that might make him feel safe. And eventually this person said they felt safe enough. They felt that they, someone cared enough about them to be with them without their own agenda to fix him, that he eventually was able to begin to get out of the depression. So I just wanted to share that that could be another alternative in addition to what everyone else has said. Okay, thank you. Certainly. We have a five minute warning. Is there, does anyone with us have anything else to share or um, any one of the panelists wanna add some closing remarks? Um, I do wanna talk about a few of the policies that we have going on during the legislative session right now. And I know as we talked about the children, I know there was just something recently where um, Senator Cassidy mentioned they are actually working to make sure there's enough mental health treatments and things that are provided to the schools where kids are not having to leave or after school go to an appointment. They're trying to bring those resources 
to the school so that way they can they can feel comfortable um, not leaving school or being able to still be at school, but get the help and treatment that they need or talk to someone that they need. So I know that's that's one. And there's a couple others that I would like to mention. So of course, we would ask for support in all of those. There's another one. Um, it's and I'm sorry, maybe I should give the bill. The first one I just mentioned was H bill seven. No, let's see. My apologies, I don't have the bill number for that one, but I do want to mention um, SB 61, which is um, creating a mental health license plate for motor vehicles. Uh, I, I definitely believe that's a good one, making sure um, there are so many other organizations and agencies that have their own license plate. So this one would be designed, um, especially for our mental health. Then we also have H bill, HB 746, which um, is designed towards, again, children that's in juvenile centers or detention centers, keeping their solitary, solitary, solitary confinement to four hours. We know how, how detrimental confinement can be for a long period. So at least for now, they're keeping it down to four hours only. And there's one more that I would like to mention, which is HB 334. And that's relating to uh, peer support specialists, in recovery, being able to um, being able to become a peer support specialist, even though you may have a conviction, as long as it's not been um, under five years. So that's just a few. There's so many more, and if you go to our website, we can share more of those with you guys if y'all are interested. So I'll let somebody else have the floor. I think there's some. Go ahead, Mr. Winton. Well, I, I mean, I, I just wanted to say thank you guys for having me. And um, anytime we get a chance to talk about mental health and wellness, um, and I get to sit on an awesome panel with you guys, it, it, it gives me hope to know that we're at least trying to do something to move in the direction of wellness, especially in the Black community. Um, and and just being vessels, you know, to to make sure that we're discussing it, especially with you know, men, men in general. And as a man, I've always, you know, spent a lot of time talking and adults are not my specialty, children are, but I spend a lot of time, you know, discussing, you know, getting men mentally healthy, getting them emotionally healthy, less acknowledging all of those, the seven things that we experience. let's acknowledge those emotions for what they are, so. Great. Uh, and I just wanted to remind us that there are things we can do to maintain our own mental health. We need to play. We need to be in nature. We need to feel that we have people around us with whom we can be vulnerable. We need to have trust in people in our lives. Healthy eating, eating is important. We know, know that food impacts the gut biome and our um, mental well-being. And this idea of self-care and knowing ourselves, knowing how we need to care for ourselves so that we can turn up first for ourselves and for others. So I wanted to end with a favorite poem of mine. Um, it's called Love After Love. And it's my gift to you all for coming for my great panel. And, um, just want to share these few words with you, love after love. Um, it goes, the time will come when with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror. And each will smile at the others, welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to itself to the stranger who has loved you all your life, whom you ignored for another, who knows you by heart. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. So my hope is that we may all be safe. We may be happy and we may be at ease and at peace. And again, thank you all so very much for carving out this hour 
to be with us. I hope it was worth your time with us. Thank you. Thank you.